Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining this webinar about funding for applied qualitative research. My name is Claire Jinks and I lead the qualitative work stream in the NIHR incubator for methodology. We've got over a thousand people registered on this webinar today, which is an incredible response and we're really pleased that this webinar is of interest to you. When we did our first webinar last year, we asked participants what topics they'd like for future webinars and funding for research came out as one of the top priorities. So in today's session, uh, we'll give you an overview of funding opportunities so that you can go away afterwards to find out more relevant things that are relevant for your own needs. And we hope that um, everyone will find something today, regardless of what career stage you're at. So just a few housekeeping uh, things before we start. Um, if you want to use Zoom's auto transcription for the webinar, you can turn them on by clicking on the live transcription button and selecting the uh, show subtitles. If you'd like a copy of today's slides, um, you can provide your email address in the brief uh, webinar evaluation survey after the, the webinar today, and we can then send them to you via email. So Zoom will automatically share a link to the evaluation form when you leave the webinar, but we'll also post it in the chat. Please do provide your feedback in this very brief evaluation survey on the content of the webinar and also your ongoing um, um, career development needs um, because that will really help us to plan a future activity. So the webinar is also going to be recorded um, and will be available on the NIHR YouTube uh, channel very soon so please do keep an eye out for that over the next coming weeks. Uh, next slide please Gareth. So here's the programme for the webinar today. Um, in this brief introduction, I'll give you a very quick overview of the methodology incubator and the aims of the qualitative work stream um, within the incubator. And then in the first session, we'll hear from Professor Marion Knight, Professor Elaine Hay and Mr Gareth O'Brien about the Research for Patient Benefit Scheme, Research for Social Care Scheme, the Programme Grant Scheme and personal fellowships that are available in the NIHR Academy. Then in session two, we'll focus on research methods funding. We'll hear from Professor Alicia O'Cahorn, Dr. Rosalind Roberts and Professor Lucy Yardley about examples of methodology research and the better methods for better research funding stream. We won't have questions and answers after each of the short talks because we've got a 45 minute Q&A session towards the end of the webinar and all the speakers will be uh, involved in, in a panel. Um, two members of our qualitative uh, work stream will be helping to monitor the chat and uh, will be raising questions and so you'll hear their voices uh, during the Q&A session as well. I would just like to say a big thank you to all of the speakers for giving up their time to support the event today um, and also to colleagues in the NIHR Academy. There's been a lot of work going on behind the scenes um, to organise and, and help run the event so thank you to colleagues as well. Next slide please Gareth. Thank you. So I'm just going to start by giving a very brief overview of the methodolo methodology incubator, um, just in case um, people aren't aware of, of what the incubator is. It's one of eight NIHR funded incubators. It was established in 2020 um, and all of the incubators um, were established to really address areas where there was a recognised need to build research capacity on, on a national level. So the incubators focus on identifying barriers that exist um, to building research capacity and to suggest and implement where we can possible solutions um, to these barriers in, in kind of sustainable and, and meaningful way. So all of the incubators are careers focused initiatives. And in the methodology incubator, our aims are to increase capacity in methodology, to attract and retain people in rewarding careers as methodologists, to support training and development pathway for methodologists and also to work with the NIHR infrastructure so for example the academy and the funding streams to develop and increase opportunities for methodologists to apply for funding to undertake methodology research. Next slide please. So there are eight work streams in the NIHR methodology incubator. Um, the first two, uh, they're all listed here, the first two are cross-cutting work streams, the awareness raising and an internship and training work streams. The qualitative work stream also includes mixed methods because a lot of our uh, members also undertake qualitative research as part of bigger mixed method studies. So today we'll be talking about qualitative research funding, as standalone funding, but also in the context of uh, mixed methods research. 
Next slide, please. So the aim of the qualitative research is to support research capacity development and careers of qualitative methodologists. In particular, we want to build a network of qualitative researchers, work with ongoing initiatives to support qualitative researchers' careers, and identify challenges um, to career development and identify possible solutions to those challenges. We're aiming to raise awareness of the value of qualitative research and also promote development and innovation in qualitative research, and then raise awareness of career development and funding opportunities. And that's one of the reasons for our webinar today. Next slide, please. So we have a team of 25 members in our work stream um, who are listed on the slide here today. Um, we've set up a Twitter account uh, recently, so you can follow us um, if you are on Twitter. We've got five uh, subgroups in the work stream um, and they're listed on the slide here. And so if you're interested in any of these uh, subgroups, please do get in touch. Next slide, please. So this slide just gives two examples of some of the activities we've been doing recently um, and how the members of our work stream are linking in and working with uh, others and existing networks. So only yesterday, um, Dr. Amy Russell participated in a webinar working with UCL's Qualitative Health Research Network to discuss open science and qualitative research, some of the issues and challenges that that presents and, and identifying some of the ways forward. Some of our other Workstream members are interested in using qualitative research alongside trials. Um, oh, sorry, Gareth, could you go back to the previous slide? Thank you. Some of our other Workstream members are interested in qualitative research alongside trials and are members of the NIHR UKRI funded trials methodology research partnership. Dr. Katie Gillis is very active in this network um, and they're doing an upcoming webinar about implementation of trials methods uh, research and the TRIP study. So do sign up to this if you're interested in qualitative research methods uh, alongside trials. Thanks, Gareth. Um, the networking team in our incubator uh, work stream led by uh, Dr. Nicola Cornwall have developed a, um, a methodology research methods map um, and developing methods, uh, sorry, developing networks and opportunities for collaborations were identified as priorities um, for career development in our launch event last year. So we've developed this, this networking map. It's now gone live on the Methodology Incubator website. So please do go on and add your details to the map. Um, if you're interested in connecting with people who have the same methods interest as you, or even if you're looking to develop uh, into expertise in different methods. So please do go on to the website, have a look and add yourself to the uh, Methodology Research Network map. And then finally, we're, we're currently putting together the programme for a webinar later in the year around impact and qualitative research. We're undertaking some work assessing how qualitative research is captured in ref impact case studies. Um, so please do look out um, for that uh, in due course. Next slide, please. So I've given a very, big, very, very brief overview of the aims of the methodology incubator and our qualitative work stream. So now we can turn our attention to the topic for today, which is all about funding for qualitative research. And before we start, we wanted to just live a launch, uh, launch a live poll um, just to hear about your experiences of applying for funding. Um, we want to know about your experiences of applying for qualitative research funding, either as um, a standalone project or as a larger mixed methods project. So I think um, colleagues uh, are going to launch the polls. We've got three short questions. Um, where have you applied uh, to for qualitative research funding? So there are uh, multiple choice options here, um, just to see the types of places that you are applying to for qualitative funding, whether that's a standalone project or as a mixed methods project. So hopefully you, you um, have been able to answer to that poll. Okay, I think there's lots of examples as well coming up here in the chat. That's fantastic. Okay, can we, can we share the results of that first poll? I think, ah, here we go, fantastic. 
Thank you. So yeah, we've got a lot of people going to the NIHR funding streams. Also, quite a few people not previously applied today, so that's good. Hopefully, you'll uh, learn a lot about some of the opportunities available to you. Yeah, research councils, charities, own higher education institutes. Yep, small amount in the industry and private sector. And then other examples in the chat. Okay, that's great. Thank you. So um, we can go to the next question. Um, have you been successful in getting funding for qualitative research? So just four response options here. Always, sometimes, never, or you've not applied for funding. You can just leave that running for a couple of 30 seconds. Okay, thank you. Yep, that might be might be expected. Sometimes and um, very unusual to always have uh, all of your grant submissions uh, successful. And again, we can see that we've got some people here, quite a lot of people who haven't applied for funding. So that's that's great that um, hopefully you'll get a good overview of some of the opportunities available to you today. And then the final quick poll just before we move on. Um, have you been successful in, oh sorry, no, we've just done that one. Um, which roles apply to you? Um, so we're just interested to see um, who's who's on the call today, what types of roles you've been um, involved with during getting uh, funding for qualitative or mixed methods research, whether you've been the lead grant applicant, the chief investigator, whether you've been lead for a particular part of a project, where you've been a co-applicant, you've been named as a member of a research team on a grant, or you've been employed to work on a project but you weren't named on the grant. Okay, thank you. So we've got um, a lot of people who've been employed, uh, but not named on the grant. 64% who've been named as a member of the research team. We've got a good spread of, of people on the call, people who've been chief investigators, and also people that have been leading parts of projects. Okay, thank you very much uh, for um, responding to those polls. So um, we can move on um, to um, our first of the short talk. So our first session is um, around funding opportunities for applied qualitative research. So you're going to get a good overview of what's available in the NIHR funding streams. And I'm delighted um, to invite Professor Marion Knight, who is Director of the Research for Patient Benefit Scheme. And she's going to talk about research for patient benefit and the research for social care. So thank you, Marion, and over to you. Uh, thank you very much, and it's it's fantastic to see so many of you on the webinar this morning. <clears throat> so uh, I imagine some of you are quite familiar with uh, the Research for Patient Benefit or RFPB programme, uh, but for those of you who are not, here's a quick overview. Um, so we fund research projects on a very wide range of areas, uh, which are all concerned with the day-to-day -day practice of health services and social care. Uh, the program is response mode and researcher led. And what that means is you are the people who are identifying with your uh, uh, public and patient uh, collaborators the questions that need answering. Uh, we support qualitative and quantitative research, but the key thing is that we have to be able to see a, a clear trajectory uh, to, to public benefit, to patient or uh, care user benefit. Over the past, uh, I've forgotten how many years now, we've funded uh, more than 1,200 awards. That's more than £270 million. Um, and I guess the important thing uh, for those of you listening is that although we're a national programme, we fund uh, research on a regional level. Uh, so you'll see from the map on the right, there are eight regional advisory committees. So uh, as, a, as a lead researcher, your um, research would be considered by the committee uh, in your area. And we're obviously keen to identify, uh, to, to fund research, which is particularly uh, pertinent to, to local areas, although we do fund collaborative research, which, which spans regions. 
We have three funding calls every year uh, and it's a two stage process, but the first stage application is relatively short. So it's, it, and it doesn't require detailed costing. So very straightforward. Uh, we fund projects up to 500,000 pounds for three years. Um, but the important thing, I think, uh, particularly for qualitative researchers is to be aware of the, the tiers, uh, the tiered funding strategy. So at that 500,000 level, we're expecting proposals which will lead immediately and directly to, to patient benefit, so to a change in, in health or care. And typically that might include uh, a randomised controlled trial. We have a tier where uh, we have largely feasibility studies, which is has a limit of 250,000. Um, and tier three, uh, which is funds up to 150,000, um, uh, we typically describe as either higher risk proposals or those which have a longer trajectory to patient benefit. And this is where we would typically see standalone uh, qualitative research proposals. Research for social care is an embedded uh, part of our FPB, which has two funding calls per year and covers both adult and children's social care. Uh, it has a very similar model to our FPB, but, but with wider eligibility in terms of where the uh, grants can be held. Uh, the National Committee is, is social care experts, uh, so it's not a regional committee, it's a national uh, uh, committee. Um, and we also have an extra stage of providing additional advice between stage one uh, and stage two. And within that uh, stream, we don't have funding tiers. So good news in terms of qualitative methodology is that of the 1,200 projects that we funded, 10% uh, have qualitative methods as a main uh, methods component. And in addition, we funded just over 500 feasibility studies. And as many of you will realize that the majority of these have a qualitative component as well. Um, qualitative uh, methodology as part of a process evaluation is often included in full trials as well. So RFPB is a, is a great um, opportunity for, for qualitative researchers. RFSC, uh, nearly all of the research we've funded with RFSC uses qualitative methods. And just some examples of RFPB research projects, uh, effective cancer management, um, treatment and care, uh, understanding the, the population priorities, uh, mental health recovery for, for survivors of modern uh, slavery, uh, a qualitative investigation of attitudes towards infant feeding among new mothers living with HIV and uh, understanding stakeholders' perspectives in, in implementing deprescribing. And I hope that you can see by looking at those titles, an immediate means whereby the, uh, the findings from the qualitative elements will go forward to, uh, to either design um, a, a, a new potential um, study, a, a new potential investigation, or indeed how we might implement best quality practice. Um, uh, similarly, um, uh, methodological, um, uh, sorry, qualitative elements that um, uh, are embedded within, within uh, RCTs, include an RCT assessing, uh, assessing effectiveness and cost effectiveness of a home-based self-management standing frame program, and the effectiveness and key to qualitative uh, methodology acceptability of urine collection devices. Um, and, and these have both had a substantial impact already. In terms of RFSC, again, just some examples um, that might um, uh, be very familiar to some of the issues that, that you are dealing with in your research. So understanding interaction in, in problematic dementia, co-production of, of best practice recommendations and a qualitative study of the of the potential for asset based approaches to support uh, parents with learning dis with learning difficulties and and we certainly frequently see in our qualitative research uh, focus on some of the most vulnerable groups that that we are uh, um, dealing with in health and care. 
Um, very exciting for me as a, a relatively new uh, program director is our new series of highlight notices. Um, we identified within RFPB that um, we have a mismatch between um, the uh, professional background of our applicants and um, the, the, the number that are um, uh, from methodological groups in terms of uh, the ratio between uh, co-applicant and lead uh, such that we're going to have uh, a new highlight notice specifically for uh, methodologists launched later this year. We recently uh, uh, launched a call for nurses and midwives, but we will have a call specifically for methodologists in the spring uh, with a deadline for submissions by September. And we will have a, a, a webinar once we uh, announce that. One final thing for those of you, and I noticed a number of you are already experienced lead investigators, we do still have opportunities for, for methodologists on our regional advising advisory committees and, and vacancies are advertised on the uh, NIHR webpage. So do please take a look if you're interested. It's a fantastic development opportunity, uh, as well as an important way to, to contribute to, to funding the research. Thank you. Thank you, Marion, for a really lovely overview of the uh, Research for Patient Benefit and Research for Social Care schemes. And it's great to see those examples um, of recent projects and the examples you've given having real impact on, on um, quality care and improving health. So thank you for those, um, those that, that overview. And I, I've already noticed quite a few questions in the chat uh, around um, just clarifying the um, changes to the scheme um, and the eligibility for the scheme and uh, some of the uh, questions related to the tiers. So we'll come back to, to picking up on some of those questions um, in the Q&A later. So thank you for that overview. So we'll now move on to um, Professor Elaine Hay, who's um, Director of the NIHR Programme Grants for Applied Research Scheme. Um, I've noticed a question in the chat around uh, what's the difference with the programme grants to the other schemes, and I'm sure Professor Hay is going to um, tell us all about that. So over to you, Elaine. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Um, so yes, yeah, so good morning, everybody. There are so many of you out there, it's a bit scary, but uh, I can't see you, but I assume that you are you are all there hiding behind your computers. Uh, next slide, Gareth, please. <clears throat> so I've been, I've been director of the Programme Grant Scheme for coming up for five years now, and, and I thought it would just be helpful in this session just to give you some of my reflections on the role of qualitative research within NIHR. Much of what Marion has said about the remit and scope of RFPB also does apply to programme grants in that we're fairly downstream. We fund research that's quite close to benefit to patients, the public and carers. Um, I guess the difference is that we're a national scheme, so we don't have the regional focus that RFPB has and that we fund programmes of research rather than standalone projects. <clears throat> but there's a there's a lot of synergy. In fact, you know, we like to see run through of, of research that started in RFPB, but uh, but then leads to bigger, bigger programmes of research. I would say that one of the great things about the programme grant scheme is that it's very flexible. Um, it includes programme grants, but there's also um, another bit to this scheme, which is the programme development grants. The two types of programme development grants, programme development grants, Stream A and Stream B. Stream A are programme development grants that you can apply for before you apply for a programme grant to maybe answer, to plug some gaps, to answer key elements, to build your team, um, pro, the stream B, I'll say a little bit more about later on, but essentially you can apply for stream B programme development grants at any stage during your programme or after your programme has finished. And that might sound a bit strange that you have programme development grants, but these are grants to further develop your programme, typically to do some methodological work 
or to do some knowledge mobilization implementation work at the end of your program. The fact that program grants have multiple work packages does mean that often we do see and we would like to see work packages that are that are devoted to qualitative research. <clears throat> We're also a response mode. I did I actually took out the word researcher led because we we like to think that we're led by patients and public priorities, so not just researchers' interests. And we hope that by the end of the programme, something magical happens and what you come out with is bigger than the sum of the individual parts. So next slide, Gareth, please. <clears throat> but there is a but. Um, and looking back, I would say that despite the fact that we fund a lot of qualitative research, we rarely have research programmes that are led by qualitative researchers. And traditionally, the qualitative components of our programmes have been about uh, limited to qualitative research in, in terms of developing interventions or process evaluation. And it has got a bit boring, to be honest. It's a little bit formulaic. We often get um, th what I call theory soup. So we, it's often hard to tell what the qualitative research to those of us that aren't experts in the field are going to do. And, and you, we get told that we are going to do research due to this, that or the next theory, which often doesn't help us. It would help us if you actually explained what you were going to do, why you were going to do it, and uh, and why, you know, justify the methods you were using. But more importantly, the findings and the outputs from the qualitative research often just get completely lost in the whole story. Um, and it, I think this was typically, typically the case when most of our um, programs were about developing and testing complex intervention. And you tell us that they were mixed methods, but they weren't merely. Yes, we were using different methods in the programs, but the analysis was often the qualitative research was analyzed and the quantitative research was analyzed. But it was nearly always the case that the quantitative findings trump the qualitative findings. And I don't know why that is the case. I don't think it should be the case because actually it was often the qualitative findings that 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 um, that threw up some really really interesting findings. But if the trial was negative, i.e., there was no difference between the intervention and the control groups at the end, which I have to say is usually the case for trials of complex interventions. It seemed to be that the findings from the qualitative studies got dismissed, and that needs to change. Uh, next slide. So I was thinking, well, why is this the case and what are the barriers to really having some really exciting, innovative, qualitative research in programmes? And there are various myths out there that I would just like to try and bust for you. I think it probably did used to be the case, to be fair, that the programme grant scheme funded mainly the development and testing of complex interventions. And one of the things I've tried really hard during my time as a director is to shift that and to encourage programmes that, um, that encompass lots of different ways of evaluating um, health and social care um, interventions or not necessarily interventions, it could be natural experiments. And we had um, uh, you know, a specific call for research that incorporated diverse methods. And people said, well, what do you mean by diverse methods? And it's actually easier to say what it isn't than what it is. So it, it's stuff that isn't just the developing and testing of a complex intervention. NIHR mainly funds quantitative research. Yeah, I mean, this was said to me last week and and it was said in the way that, well, there's no point applying to ANIHR with qualitative studies because you never you don't understand it. The committees are biased towards trials. Reviewers don't understand what we're doing. Um, and and again, I don't think that is the case. And it would be worth just saying a little bit about process here. So the programme grants applications are a two stage process at stage one, which is an outline application. We address 
what I tend to call the so what question. So is this research that you've made the case to us is really important for the health and social care system? Applications that are shortlisted at stage one are then reviewed by methodologists, including qualitative researchers, and you get that feedback to help you develop the stage two application. And all the stage two applications are again reviewed by a range of methodologists and generalists that sit on our committees, including qualitative researchers. But I have to say the harshest critics of the qualitative research are the qualitative researchers that sit on the committees. And this is, you know, this is not always terribly helpful to your profession, I have to say. We don't, no, no research proposal is perfect, particularly in the applied health research field. So just try and be a bit kinder sometimes when you're reviewing applications. Yes, give constructive criticism. Yes, give positive feedback, but don't let your review sink qualitative proposals. And that does happen. So I thought that's just a sort of interesting snippet for you to take, take away. Next slide, please. So here are some examples of um, research that have come in under our diverse proposals call that have a major qualitative component. And we want to see these. We do want to see them. And you, if you go on to the program grant um, bit of the NHR website, you can access these, uh, these programs. Next slide. So although the program grant um, stream is response mode, we do have, we're not completely rudderless and we do have some strategic priorities. And I thought it was just worth sharing these with you. And these emerged from a meeting we had with our committee members last March, and we've got another one coming up this, this March. And reading them, I just felt that these were really up your street. You see, it was very clear from the committee members that they wanted research that really tackled the increasingly complex health and social care challenges that we see. Patients with multiple health conditions, how, um, patients that are underrepresented in, in research and both bolster methodological research. And so, you know, this is why I think as qualitative researchers, you really, really need to help us deliver these strategic priorities and make your mark. So I'm just going to talk very briefly about two specific areas that I think will might interest you. Uh, next slide, please, Gareth. The first is that I'm really pleased to announce that from this spring, you will be able to embed fellowships within, um, within your programmes. Um, and these can be at any stage, right through from internships to postdoc fellowships. And I anticipate that these are people who probably would have been employed on the programmes anyway, but hopefully it will give these people a higher visibility and will be, you'll be able to incorporate their training costs within the funding for the programme. And we're, we're saying that you can apply for up to 10% of the funding envelope of your program to support fellowships within the programs so when you rec when you you know if you do the sums most of our programs are two and a half to three million pounds so that gives you a really chunky budget to be able to employ fellowships and it will be quite a light touch approach but the good news is that having worked with the academy on this the fellows employed on your programs will have access to all the academy training opportunities so look out for those and we hope to see applications for qualitative researchers next slide and the other thing I mentioned at the beginning was that we have we have expanded further the program development grant scheme. And so you can now apply for what we're calling a stream B program development grant at any stage during the running of your program. And the reason for doing this is that we felt that this was a way because often when you're in the middle of your program, other research ideas come up that you that you maybe hadn't anticipated when you started your research. And so you can now apply for £150,000 up to two years to do some add-on, slightly risky, slightly off the wall, different research that, uh, that, that is linked to your programme. Uh, next slide, Gareth. And we hope, next slide, Gareth. 
and we're hoping and anticipating that these will not be led by the chief investigators of the programme. They'll be led by more junior researchers, early career researchers. They may have been applicants on the original programme grant, but not necessarily. So this is a really, really interesting and innovative way to help fund methodological research. So next slide. So my challenge to you now is looking forwards. What I want to see in the next five years is qualitative research really taking a much more prominent and leading role across the NIHR, but I guess from my perspective, particularly within the programme grant scheme. We want your methods to be really rigorous. And I think this is important because this is, and you have to explain to the non-qualitative researchers on the committees why your methods are rigorous. I want to see where it's appropriate, it might not always be appropriate, but where it's appropriate that the qualitative findings and the quantitative findings have an equal voice and are analyzed as truly mixed methods uh, research. And um, given that actually the quantitative findings are often not analysed as you go along in the programme, we often don't get the results from the quantitative findings until the end. It's really important that the qualitative findings act as a glue between the various work package and help shape the overall de delivery of the programme. And to my mind, it's the only qualitative research is the, really the only way we're going to tackle the inclusivity agenda. You know, if you, I mean, I, you know, I made my career on, on trials and multi-centre trials, but if you just reflect on the fact that most multi-centre trials will probably recruit about 2% of the eligible population, particularly primary care trials. And I can bet you, we can bet our bottom dollar that who those people will be. We're not getting representation in our trials. And I think that's where qualitative research can really add depth to our research. <clears throat> and yeah, the, one of the missions I think for you is to help topple this pyramid of research evidence, which I think has disadvantaged qualitative research for a long time. So finally, last slide, <clears throat> you do have a secret weapon. And I think, you know, part of it is the number of people on this on this webinar. But actually, we've not really talked very much about the involvement of patients and publics and health professionals. And your research really speaks to these people. They understand your research. And it comes out with such powerful messages that I think you should you should you should encapsulate this and you should play to your strengths. So hopefully that's given you an optimistic view of what we want to fund in programme grants. And I'm sure the same speaks for other bits of the NIHR. Sorry, Claire, I've probably gone over time, but I'm sorry, I apologise for that. No, thank you, Elaine. Uh, no need to apologise. That was a fantastic overview. And um, yeah, you've given um, us really clear steer um, around um, the needs of the programme grants, the value of qualitative research in the programme grants. You've given us a call to action in a way to, um, you know, to help um, topple this evidence pyramid. So it's really great to hear that coming from you as the director of the programme grant scheme. Um, and I'm sure I've noticed a few questions in the chat. So there'll be a lot of interest um, in, in picking up on some of those uh, issues you've raised. It's great to hear about the fellowships scheme. That's a fantastic uh, change to the scheme and the expansion to program B um, and that we can embed methodological research within that as a less risky option that you won't affect the, the big programme, but there's opportunities within that scheme. That is really fantastic to hear. So thank you. OK, so um, we're going from the big programmes uh, now to uh, more personal fellowships. So some of the awards that you can get through the NIHR um, Academy as a personal uh, award. Um, so I'm delighted we've got uh, Mr Gareth O'Brien here, who's the C Senior Programme Manager from the Academy. And he's going to give us an overview of the different types of funding opportunities through these personal fellowships. So thank you, Gareth. And um, over to you. Thanks, Claire. Hi, everyone. I'm just going to share my screen. So give me a quick second. Can we just confirm that we can see that okay? Yes, we can see that, thank you. Perfect, cheers everyone. So morning, I'm Gareth O'Brien. As Claire said, I'm a Senior Programme Manager 
at the NRHR Academy and I work in the personal awards team where all of these awards that I'm going to be talking about today are hosted. So just to say I'm going to cover a pretty large amount of information in quite a short period of time today but I am going to share the slides afterwards and the slides that I'll share will have more information on about the schemes around the different levels that you can apply at the eligibility eligibility criteria the remit and so on like that so I would always consider you to I would always encourage you sorry to read the guidance notes ahead of applying to our schemes and um, just to say very early on that we're a super approachable team in the academy so if you ever got any questions that you want to iron out with us if there's any questions about stuff that you're applying for anything that you're unsure about I would just encourage you to get in touch with us and ask those questions so you'll know that the overall NIHR's mission is to improve the health and wealth of the nation through research but you might be a little bit less informed on how we do that at the academy so in the academy we do that in a number of ways they're outlined on the slide we develop and coordinate academic training because we want to attract train and develop the research leaders of the future um, and to do that we have a variety of national competitions and further research capacity building exercises that we that we run throughout the course of the year all of this activity is the aim of finding solutions to current and emerging health and care problems through research so I really like this slide because it sums up our offer in in one picture however maybe as qualitative researchers you can't see yourselves in this schematic diagram so it's my job to explain today where you fit in our overall strategy for funding research so this summarizes the green section in the slide that you saw previously that goes down the left hand side um, and this is the fellowships for all section so everyone on this call i think based on what i saw in the original polls is probably eligible for some of our fellowships um, these go through from pre-doctoral level all the way through to professorship and chair and support you at doctoral, postdoctoral, um, including senior postdoctoral level. So hopefully you'll see something in that diagram that's relevant to your career stage. Now, what do we fund? So before I discuss the specifics of our awards, I want to touch on the offer that we've got for you, though this does vary slightly by award. So in general, we'll fund your salary, inclusive of your academic and clinical time, any conference attendance, which is normally within uh, which is normally within a budget uh, any research visits that you're going to do as part of your fellowship and we'll also fund your research costs in totality as well as the cost of any academic training associated with your fellowship and any professional training and development costs that you want to undertake it's worth noting because these are fellowships that your training and development plan is probably just as important as your research plan overall so we really want to understand when you undertake a fellowship why you want to do it and how it takes you from where you are currently in the stage of your career to where you want to be by the end of your fellowship and obviously your training and development plan is such a huge part of that one that i think is incredibly relevant for people in the virtual room with us today is our pre-doctoral fellowship um, so if you're an aspiring methodologist or an early career researcher our pre-doc fellowship allows you to complete a master's or a master's level training program um, alongside a specific training program for you to develop uh, and to undertake a future PhD. So we can see the examples at the top of this slide where you could start a career. It includes both qualitative research and mixed methods. And as part of this award, you can take funding for one to two years between 50 and 100 percent of your whole time equivalent. So it's flexible options to keep it. So you could maybe run your fellowship alongside what you're currently doing or take it up as a full time offer. As mentioned on the previous slide, this includes funding for salary, training and development costs, and it will pay your master's fees. This scheme is currently open um, and it launches annually every January. I thought it would be interesting to share a couple of statistics as part of this presentation with you. So um, these are the type of applications that we see. So as you can see, generally speaking, as a percentage um, for both mixed methods and qualitative research, we see somewhere between 25 and 32-ish percent across the rounds that are that the applications make up from these disciplines. So I think for me, that just shows the scope to increase the number of applications we get through mixed methods and qualitative as part of this scheme, because it's, it's quite a low percentage at the moment um, for the applications that we receive. In addition to that, we've got other fellowship options um, to support you at any current career stage. So we've got fellowships to, undertake, to support you to undertake a PhD at doctoral level. And then at advanced fellowship level, we have fellowships that support you as part of your early postdoc career following the award of a PhD, or whether you're establishing independence as a researcher, so whether you're setting up um, a big research program for the first time, 
or whether you're transitioning from one area of research into another. So that could be particularly relevant for people who, who in methodology have perhaps practiced mismethods and want to divert completely into qualitative research as an example, or you can use it as a return from a career break as you transition back into research. I think it's important, as I said at the start of the, start, at the, start of the presentation, um, in the interest of making the most out of the time I've got with you today, I've left quite a lot of detail off of these slides, but the slide set that you'll get after the presentation will have all of the information on. It's good to see that our remit for this sort of stuff is um, mirrored by the options you've seen earlier. So it's really about that uh, public benefit, uh, uh, public and patient benefit. But I did see something pop up in the chat around how that maybe doesn't speak to social care as much as it does speak to the NHS Trust. However, uh, our fellowships are designed to support you wherever you work in whatever stage of your career. So hopefully you'll be able to see something that's relevant to you through those things that I've just discussed there. But I wanted to use um, the little bit of time that I've got left today to talk about um, a bit more context on the current relationship between qualitative researchers and the academy. So, and some of our plans for the future and how we're trying to uh, build qualitative researchers and mixed methods researchers into our, into our strategy and our plans. So I did a bit of digging before presenting to you today to make sure this was true and it is. So right from pre-doctoral level all the way up to chair and professorship, we have people conducting qualitative research, whether this is a full qualitative project or whether this is part of a work package, at all career stages of our fellowship program, qualitative researchers are represented. Like others today, I thought it would be interesting to share with you some of the titles that we funded as qualitative work in the last couple of rounds. So these are really relevant for stuff that we funded very recently. I'm not going to read these out um, for fear of messing up quite a well-designed acronym, but hopefully this gives you a bit of insight into the uh, some of the work that we fund. As well as that, all of our fellowship panels have qualitative methods expertise on them, which means that when you come to interview for some of our programs or when you present to our committees, all of our committees feel confident in their ability to make decisions around funding qualitative research. It also means that when someone applies with a qualitative element to their projects, such as a work package, our committees feel confident to suggest improvements to that piece of work and provide excellent feedback to applicants, even if you're ultimately unsuccessful. Um, I think this demonstrates how much we value qualitative research in the NIHR Academy and how much we recognize the important role it has to play, which is why we've made sure that we have this skill on all of our committees to review applications and to ask questions at interview. So we'll make sure that if you apply as a qualitative researcher, that you're either interviewed or and your application is reviewed by someone who has sufficient expertise in the area to make sure you're given a fair crack when you come to part of our panels. I think. It's also a great opportunity to highlight that increasing the number of applications by methodologists to all of our awards is a strategic priority in the academy and across the wider NIHR. So I think this is a really cool opportunity to practice what we preach a little bit. So hopefully you'll be able to see that what I'm not doing today is just giving lip service to you guys as qualitative researchers. We want to fund more methodologists at the academy, including qualitative researchers. And I think this is highlighted best by it being called out specifically in best research for best health, the next chapter, which underlines our strategic ambition to strengthen careers for research delivery staff from underrepresented disciplines and specialisms. So we recognize currently that maybe we're not funding as many people as we want to in this area, and it's an area of need that we need to do more in. So, for example, me coming to coming along to speak at an event today is such a small example of how we're trying to engage with professionals like yourselves and attempting to build capacity in this area. You might also be wondering how else are we going to bring qualitative researchers into the NIHR Academy? Well, after um, the comprehensive spending review last year, we had approval from the Department of Health and Social Care to increase our, our investment and add new opportunities to our portfolio. So this includes additional money to fund more advanced fellowships that I discussed earlier to build capacity at that postdoctoral level. We're launching a success, we're launching a new internship scheme based on the success of a pilot internship scheme we ran in 2021 in collaboration with the internships and training work stream of the methodology incubator that Claire spoke about earlier to build capacity at this early career researcher level um, just as people are choosing their options for the future career so we want to target those undergraduates um, in the second and third year of the in their undergraduate degree um, and this will initially focus on methodologists as well as other professions uh, there's also the establishment upcoming of a new team science award 
which has the aim of bringing together multidisciplinary professionals to tackle emerging health and care issues, the first round of which will focus on multiple long-term conditions. And we want to make sure that methodologists are a key part of those team science teams. I think what's really interesting about the plan for that scheme is that it's quite flat in its hierarchy. So we're not um, good. We're not looking for principal investors or chief, chief investigators. We're making sure that every member of a research team can be recognized for the contribution that they make to a piece of research. So I'm really excited to take that piece of work forward personally. Um, so hopefully to, um, to the 150 odd people who had never previously applied for research today from poll one and, and for the rest of you on the call and those people who will watch this recording later on, um, hopefully you've seen something there that feels like it's for you. I've tried to touch on the different aspects of the careers that you can pick it up at, the different career stages, sorry, that you can pick up our awards at, and um, how hopefully you'll see an opportunity in there that you can that you can feel like you can apply for and get funding for and work with us in the future. So thank you very much for listening. I'm aware that I spoke a hell of a lot and spoke really quickly through that, so you will get a copy of the slides, um, but just a big thank you to Claire for putting on the event today. Um, there are my contact details on screen and you can also get in contact with my team through personal awards at nihr.ac.uk so thanks very much wonderful gareth thank you so much for that overview um there's obviously at the academy website is a treasure trove of um of opportunities for people so please do um look at what is available um through the academy um you've given us a fantastic overview of, of the pathway through the academy um opportunities there for people at all stages of the career it's great to hear about the increased investment and how um, qualitative researchers are very explicit within your strategic priorities for increasing capacity. Um, so that's really great news to hear. Um, and also thank you for flagging the, um, the best research for best health um, policy strategy document. So people can um, go away and have a look at that in more detail if they're interested in the, the overall strategy from the NIHR in terms of um, increasing uh, research uh, methods capacity. So thank you for that wonderful overview and I'm sure you'll be having people getting in touch with you and there are some questions in the chat. So I'm looking forward to the panel where you can answer some of those questions. Fabulous, thank you. Cheers. OK, so that concludes um, session one, which was all about funding for applied uh, qualitative research and some of the opportunities um, for you through the NIHR. Session two, we're moving um, focus a little bit to focus really on funding for methodology research. So how to get funding to do research on research methods. Um, so before we um, start, we've um, just got two quick questions uh, as a live poll, just to get um, some feedback from you in terms of your experiences related to um, applying for funding for research on qualitative research methods. Um, so I'm hoping Hamera um, or Gareth can launch um, the poll. Thank you, poll four. So this is this is just a very quick question. Do you have an idea? for research about qualitative research methods. So this is about innovation in methods. So the methods that we use in qualitative research, have you got an idea? Have you had an idea to do some research about the methods that we use? So we'll just give you 30 seconds or so to complete that poll. Great. Oh, good. That's that's we've got over 50 percent of people that have got ideas for uh, innovation in qualitative research methods. That's fantastic. Thank you. And then the final question. Um, is about um, the better methods, uh, better research program, um, BMBR for short. So before the webinar today, we're interested to hear if you've heard of this scheme, the better methods, the better research scheme. Um, you've heard of it and you've applied to it, you've heard of it but not applied, or you have not heard of BMBR. Okay, thank you. Okay, that's really, really illuminating. That's fantastic. Thank you. So 90% of people on the call haven't heard of, of the BMBR um funding stream so thank you very much for completing the poll so um 
it's uh, time to move on to this next set of speakers then. So I'm delighted to um, introduce Professor Alicia O'Gahorn um, as our first speaker in this session. Um, Alicia is uh, Director of the Health and Care Research Unit at the University of Sheffield. Um, she's done a lot of work um, in uh, getting funding of examples of methodology research um, on or using qualitative methods. So we're really delighted uh, you're able to tell us about that work today. Thank you, Alicia. Brilliant. So um, hi, everybody. Um, as Claire said, I'm going to look at how we develop our methods, understand more about them so that we do better research and uh, specifically focus on the, the work that I've done where I've looked at qualitative research itself or used qualitative methods to do methodolo methodological research. Uh, so Gareth, if you just uh, turn to the next slide, please. So on the, the left-hand side of this um, slide um, are some studies where I have been chief investigator or co-applicant uh, for methodological work. So the, the first study is, a, is actually a fellowship, and I applied to the uh, MRC for this fellowship uh, before the NIHR existed. That's how old I am. Uh, and uh, now we would look uh, largely to the NIHR for this kind of fellowship. And I focused on how we use mixed methods research in health services research. And as part of that uh, methodological work, uh, I did um, 20 uh, interviews, qualitative interviews with researchers from mixed methods studies. These fellowships are excellent places for methodological research. And um, I know lots of examples of um, people who do methodological research using NIHR fellowships and using qualitative interviews with people who have experienced using those methods and are reflecting on how to develop those methods. So, for example, Munya de Mero here in Sheffield University, as a statistician, got one of these fellowships to look at adaptive randomised controlled trials and learned all about qualitative research himself. So now he's a sort of multi-skilled researcher. The second project uh, was looking at how we can maximize the value of qualitative research with randomized controlled trials. And um, a team of us applied for this to what used to be called the MRC methodology panel. And that has now turned into the NIHR MRC uh, better um, uh, methods, better research. And you'll see here that um, we also took, uh, undertook qualitative interviews uh, with uh, researchers who um, undertook qualitative research with randomized controlled trials and also were the trialists who worked with the qualitative researchers. Uh, I put a, a paper in the chat um, uh, just a few moments ago when Elaine was talking, when she was talking about what do we need to put into applications uh, as qualitative researchers when writing mixed methods bids. And we looked at a number of, um, uh, we did a documentary analysis of uh, uh, applications uh, where there were randomized controlled trials and qualitative research and gave some guidance about the types of information uh, reviewers and panel members might be looking at. That's by Drabble et al. So the, the, the third uh, project uh, involved uh, looking at uh, complex interventions and how we develop them. And again, we made use of qualitative research, this time with stakeholders, not just researchers doing this kind of work, but the funding panel making ju judgments about it. Um, editors of journals making judgments about the publications coming out of this kind of work. And then finally, I was a co-applicant on Moore and Evans's um, uh, study that again went to the Better Methods, Better uh, Research um, uh, funding panel to look at um, when we have an effective intervention, well, it's been effective in a particular context, how do we go about adapting it for different contexts? And again, you can see the use of qualitative interviews with stakeholders there, this time in the context of case studies. So there are 
lots of examples of using qualitative research to do methodological uh, development. Uh, not only going to this funding stream, but I would also make a plug for um, HSDR um, funding stream, which I was surprised to hear also um, funds methodological research, particularly um, interested in um, the methods that we use commonly to explore and evaluate um, health and social care services and how we might develop them for the future. So on the right hand side of the slide, I just want to sort of address um, a few issues about this kind of work. I think uh, HSDR stands for, I, I, it's changed its name, it used to be Health Services Delivery Research, that's now Health and Social Care Delivery Research, thank you. Um, so when you apply or thinking about applying for this kind of research, I think it's really important to get your rationale right and show people why it's an important thing to do. So I'm going to give you an example of how we got this wrong and then got this right for the third project on our list when we were putting in our bid to look at the development of complex interventions. So we wrote a draft application um, and a uh, Pat Hoddenot, it was her idea to do this work. Pat Hoddenot put that through um, internal review in her organisation. And a senior member of staff there offered us really helpful feedback about our application. And um, he basically said, why would I want to fund this? Why is this important? And the way that we had addressed the importance was... Actually, it's very useful to researchers to try and understand the differences between the different approaches to complex intervention development um, and uh, how to select the, uh, an approach that's appropriate for their context and how to understand best practice in, in this environment. And um, the, the reviewer said, well, OK, that's that's fine. You'll have some researchers who will be less confused about this. Why do I want to pay money for you to do this? So he encouraged us to really push this further. And what we did was we framed the importance around research waste, that if we are not, we don't understand how to develop our interventions properly, we might be developing poor interventions, which then go on to be evaluated perhaps in randomized controlled trials. We might be spending one to two million pounds evaluating them only to find that they didn't work because they weren't used or they weren't delivered correctly. Um, so if we'd gotten it right in the earlier part of the pathway, we might have been finding that that intervention actually worked really well and was effective. So we felt that we really got that rationale and why it was important right with the help of our internal reviewer. I would also say that it's really helpful when you're uh, applying for this kind of research to draw on examples um, because it often feels quite abstract. So I reviewed uh, a methodological bid uh, recently and um, I started off, you know, looking at the title thinking, mm, is this an important thing to do? And halfway through reading the application, I was fully convinced it was important and fully convinced that they were the team to do it because they were giving me lots of examples of the problems they were facing and the community was facing and lots of examples of the potential solutions they might come up with in their study. So I found it very, very convincing. The other thing I would say is that sometimes it might be appropriate to use only qualitative methods when you're looking at um, uh, methodological development, but often it, uh, it is used in a mixed methods uh, context, certainly in the projects I've been involved with, and that might be simply because I am a, a mixed methods researcher and think in a mixed methods way, but it's useful to see the other methods that are used there, the systematic reviews, the surveys, the consensus methods, the development of guidance. Uh, the final point I want to make on this slide is that um, as researchers, we need to use technical language, but our technical language is jargon. 
to researchers who work in different fields and who have different methodological understandings and skills. So it is important when writing these applications to use what I call researcher plain English as much as you can. So the kind of language that all researchers will understand in applied health or social care research um, and public health research. Um, and by doing that, you can engage a wider range of reviewers and panel members in your work. Gareth, just the final slide, please. So here are examples of the papers that were written based on the qualitative research from some of the studies that I've talked about. And I personally have found these papers and the, the insights gained from the qualitative research to be very, very powerful. Now, what they do is they identify the messy world that we live in, because when we do our systematic reviews of papers that have been published, they are often um, cleaned up versions of how we do methods. When we do qualitative interviews with people who are using these methods and thinking about these methods in the real world, they come up with some really helpful insights about how to deal with the complexity of the, the world that we, we work within. Um, so um, I, I think that um, there's been a lot of great work being uh, published uh, based on the qualitative research we've undertaken about our methodologies that help us to improve what we do. Thank you. Thank you, Alicia, for a wonderful overview of that body of work. Um, you've given some great examples of projects where qualitative research has had a real impact on methodological innovation. Um, and um, the, the message you've given us about getting the rationale right, getting the argument right, um, it, I really, really resonated with me having tried to explain methodological research <laughs> to, to, to people or to in funding applications. So the advice you've given there about uh, how to frame the rationale and how to use the research of plain English notion it was really useful um, and I really recommend that cohort of papers that Alicia put on the, on the last slide I've certainly read them and they're really really great reading so thank you for sharing those resources and um, we'll pick up on some of those examples and uh, ideas you've given in the panel because I can see things in the chat so thank you Alicia for your overview. So our next two speakers uh, are uh, focusing on the Better Methods, Better Research scheme that um, Alicia has mentioned. Um, and I'm delighted we've got, um, we've got Dr. Rosalind Roberts, who's a programme manager at BMBR, followed by uh, Professor Lucy Yardley, who's a panel member on BMBR. So um, really uh, looking forward to hearing uh, what you are going to tell us about the relatively new scheme and some advice on uh, submitting applications. So uh, over to you, Rosalind first, thank you. Thanks a lot, Claire. And thanks for the invite to speak. Um, is that sharing okay? Lovely, thank you. So yeah, it's really great to be here to talk to you about the MRC NIHR Better Methods, Better Research Scheme. And uh, really interesting to see that a lot of you haven't heard of the program before. So hopefully I can give you um, a good introduction to the program and give you a flavor of, of the types of work that we fund and how you can go about applying. So I'm just going to give a brief overview of the programme, give you an idea of if you apply what the review process might look like, and then uh, give a few tips about what makes a successful application. And actually, some of them have already been uh, really well covered by Alicia, and I think also Lucy will, will pick up on uh, some of them later on from a panel member's perspective. So, as I said at the beginning, the program is co-funded by MRC and NIHR, and there's no ring fence around this funding, uh, apart from a small portion for guidance development, which I'll talk about in a bit later. And um, this means that it's a response mode funding investigator led, so you come to us with 
uh, your ideas. We have two rounds per year and we usually get around 30 applications per round and fund about four to six awards each meeting. So it's quite competitive. We have recently, MRC has recently uh, increased its contribution uh, to the budget. So up to 4 million from 3 million. And we're always working to increase the budget. So hopefully um, the success rate will, will go up over the next few years. Um, the awards usually range from 200,000 to 750,000. And we ask if you're planning uh, that the cost to MRC is over 500,000 that you get in touch with the program manager first. So that would be me. And the types of, of grants we receive are um, research projects, those with industry collaboration, uh, those from new investigators, so people who are just starting their own group and who haven't received significant amounts of grant funding before, and also partnership grants, which are um, a grant to essentially develop a network to bring people together. So our remit covers the development or improvement of generalizable research methods, and our remit goes all the way across MRC and NIHR remit. So as you can imagine, a, a vast range of different topics that are covered, and that's reflected in the uh, makeup of the panel who make the funding decisions. So we have 20 expert members covering everything from qualitative methods and um, behavioral methods all the way through to statistics and genetics. Um, so yeah, as Alicia said, bearing that kind of broad um, expertise in mind when you're writing the application is really important. What the panel are looking for when they receive your application is that there's a, a really well evidenced need for the method to be developed and that there's been um, really well thought through engagement of the end users for the outputs from the project. And this is really to make sure that the methods developed will end up being used and will make a tangible difference um, to the reproducibility and rigor of uh, research, which is ultimately the aim of the program. Because of this, you can request funding for dissemination activities. Um, and that's something that's, I guess, a little bit different maybe from, from other grants that you might apply for where those types of funds are really encouraged because the uptake is a really key component of uh, what we're hoping to achieve through it. In addition to the funding program, we also um, have um, strategic stakeholders. So uh, those include regulators, as well as the um, devolved nations um, health research um, bodies. So the NIHR equivalents, and along with uh, MRC, NIHR and the panel, uh, they work as a strategy group to guide our priority setting to address areas of methodological need. And this results in the issuing of strategic opportunities. So these um, will come out hopefully annually, um, but the, the timing can vary, but we try and give a, um, a lot of notice to allow people to work up their applications. And applications received in response to strategic opportunities will be an open competition with all the other applications received. But if they are within the fundable range, they will receive an uplift. So if, if they score really highly and are really great quality applications, they're more likely to get funded. The most recent one uh, that we had open was actually um, about understanding how the move to remote approaches uh, to qualitative health research had impacted uh, the, the research coming out of that. And we had a really great response to that and um, the project that was funded as a result of that is ongoing. As I mentioned before, we also have a small amount of our budget ring fence for guidance development. 
and two awards are made each year for this. Just really briefly, if you do apply to the programme, when we receive your application, we'll do a number of checks and I'll check to begin with that uh, the proposal does fall within our remit. Um, if not, it will be declined at this stage. So it's really important to get in touch with me or another programme manager if you have an idea that you would like to submit to the programme to check that it is in remit. Once uh, the application has gone through those checks, it will be sent out for external peer review and it will go to a short listing meeting where it will be assessed by the panel. Some applications are declined at this stage, usually around a third. Uh, if you get through this stage, you're able to uh, respond to reviewers' comments and also comments that you might receive from the panel at short listing. And then this will, those applications go through to uh, the final panel meeting where funding decisions are made. Just quickly, because um, I think I'm running out of time, uh, a few, few tips. So the main one is really come talk to us uh, far in advance of making your application, as well as doing remit checks. I can also give you kind of general feedback on your proposal. And um, people do find talking to us really helpful. Um, at, at an early stage as possible, engage your end users and your collaborators to help really factor in that uptake as early into the process as you can as possible. And if it's offered by your department, have your proposal go through an internal peer review. Um, and this is essential for new investigator applications. Make sure that your application is clear and bear in mind that your proposal will be read by people who are non-specialists. Um, so you really need to pitch it very generally and really make your case as to why there's a need for this new method or improved method. My takeaway from the panel is that they are very comfortable with risk when it's well accounted for and when there are mitigation strategies in place. What they don't like is uncertainty. So you need to really set out what the risks are and how you're going to deal with those if, if they uh, come up. People often make the kind of, there's a misconception that keeping the grant as low a cost as possible will mean it's successful and that really isn't the case. You need to um, make sure you have the resources you need and justify them. And finally, um, as I've mentioned before, consider how you're going to ensure that your methods can be used and taken up. And as always, consider who you want to use the method and uh, design it to meet their needs. And this can also include, um, you know, non-methodologists, people who aren't researchers, policy makers, decision makers. So the next deadline is in June. And as I mentioned, we have uh, two deadlines a year for better methods, better research. And uh, also the deadline for the guidance development call is in June. Um, when the slides are circulated, there are the links there, but I think that the link has already been put in the chat. So hopefully you have all the information you need and happy to take questions and very happy for you to email me if you need to. So thanks a lot. Wonderful. Thank you, Rosalind, for that uh, fantastic overview. Um, you've given us some clear tips there on needing to articulate the challenge, um, evidence, the problem that we're um, experiencing as, as research methodologists and to include uh, who we want to um, use the results of the methodological research. And I think we're often very used to hearing around uptake in relation to the clinical work and the clinical outcomes. And obviously with REF impact, that's a very important aspect. And we don't often focus as much attention into methodological impact and methodological knowledge mobilization and uptake so it's great to hear that that's a really important part um, of the scheme so thank you for sharing that and the fact that we've got four months if anybody's interested 
a four months, uh, I think, till the next call. So go and have a look at the, the link and see if it's something that uh, is relevant to you. So thank you for giving that perspective um, as the programme manager. Um, so we can move on to uh, Professor Yardley, who's going to give her perspective as a panel member on the BMBR uh, committee. So uh, thank you, Lucy, and we look forward to hearing what you're going to tell us. Thanks very much, Claire. Um, OK, I'm going to race through this because uh, other people have mentioned quite a lot of the things that I was going to mention, but I'm very much um, aware uh, of the perspective of people that are relatively early career and maybe haven't put in grant applications before. Uh, so I, I'm going to try to have uh, give you an idea of what it's like having your a proposal assessed by a panel and that might also be of interest to people that have had um, unsuccessful submissions before and, and wondered why that was. Next slide please. So I'm going to start by thinking about what kinds of qualitative research the panel funded previously. Uh, then I'm going to talk about the criteria for success and then I'm going to give a brief example of a recently funded project. Next slide please. Okay, now I have actually put qualitative topics in inverted commas because some of the topics that have been funded under this heading seem more qualitative than others to me. So um, I should say I've only been on the panel. I, I think I've been on two or three um, panels so far. So I don't actually have personal experience of the much, much earlier uh, grants, but I don't think necessarily all of them um, would be considered qualitative studies. I think they're qualitative stu uh, they're studies that included a qualitative component. Um, but there are some studies that are very clearly completely qualitatively focused, such as um, a realist evaluation uh, of the status of remote qualitative data collection. And um, a recent one that I was a part of the panel for was a collaborative um, and digital analysis of big qualitative data. Uh, in time sensitive context. So I'm going to give that as an example. So what you'll probably see is that previously only about one study that even contained any qualitative element was being funded a year. And then um, last year that seems to have picked up. Uh, and of course you've got to bear in mind that there, is, there may only be say 10, 10 um, studies overall each year funded. Uh, so that it's not quite as a low proportion as it might seem and it's probably on a positive trajectory and I think it's also because we haven't seen many qualitative proposals submitted as um, it, it really wasn't that surprising to discover that nobody on this um, webinar had heard of the scheme and hopefully there'll be a lot more proposals submitted now that everybody knows about it. Next slide please. So I was just going to return briefly uh, <laughs> to some of the <clears throat> uh, tips that have already been given for um, how to make sure that your application does as well as possible. And I'd want to really emphasize engaging end users and collaborators uh, because sometimes proposals come forward uh, qualitative or non-qualitative, where it's, it's quite a small group of people have clearly got together uh, with an idea that might indeed be promising, but they're kind of a little bit inward focused. Uh, and it really helps the proposal if you can show that you have been talking to a very wide range of people and have managed to get them already excited about what you're going to do. So the knowledge mobilization really starts before you even put the proposal together. Next slide, please. Uh, in terms of uh, the other panel members and their lack of qualitative expertise, uh, I mean, I know nothing about genetic methodologies. Um, and so, you know, people on the panel have to really trust the panel members who are experts, but also use their own abilities to uh, evaluate whether something looks like it might be important and feasible um, and, and so on, even if they don't have the methodological ex expertise. And that's where it's really helpful if uh, you, you write very clearly, um, but you also make it very clear what is already known 
what is out there and how what you do is going to build on that and and that you can make that point really clearly to people that don't have that expertise um, and don't forget to reference your own work in the area. The reason why I mention that is that if you can show that you are already quite expert, um, or at least parts, uh, some of your team members are, even if you're a little bit more early career, that will really help as well. Next slide, please. Um, and in terms of this accounting for risks issue, basically, um, the reviewers like to see that you have kind of lived your grant in advance, that you have thought about each step, what you will encounter and what you're going to do to overcome anything that might limit its success. So it, you, it, you need to have gone further than just having the good idea. You need to have really carefully thought out how you're going to implement that good idea at every step uh, and anticipating and overcoming every possible objection. Next slide, please. And ensuring uptake, this knowledge mobilization aspect can't be overemphasized. Uh, it really is the purpose of this panel um, and this funding stream to bring new methods to as wide a, a section of the research community as possible. So qualitative researchers could sometimes be accused of um, focusing on quite small um, distinctions or distinctions that might sm seem small to people outside their particular specialism. And those kinds of uh, methodological improvements are less likely to be funded by this panel. Uh, the panel wants to see important uh, uh, improvements in methodology that are going to have widespread ramifications um, really for the whole of health research, not just for the finer points of qualitative methods. Next slide, please. So um, what gets you over the funding threshold? I thought I would just uh, direct your attention to what the criteria are that as a panel we are asked to use. And you'll see that at six, uh, a level of rating of six, uh, your stuff should be high quality, fundable, methodologically robust, appropriate team, worthwhile question, justifiable resource, potential for impact, and you have the resources to deliver it. And at the end of that, I have to tell you that something that is funded six will never make it to through this panel because the ones that make it through are funded eight usually and above. So next slide. So um, I have I've shown you here what eight looks like and how it compares with seven, which you know you with a rating of seven, it's possible you might get funded, but unlikely. And it's really just more of everything. So it has to be really high quality, really high quality, really high priority for funding in terms of need, original as well as innovative. And the leadership has to be excellent, not just strong, with a crucial scientific question and potential for high impact. And coming back to my point, resource of value to many disciplines. Um, so I hope that helps you see uh, it, how it is very, very competitive. And you, you know, if you think you've just got a good research idea that you could do well, that isn't enough. You have to be the best team possible to do something really important, really well. Uh, next slide, please. So what does this look like? Uh, well, the recently funded uh, qualitative study uh, really picked up on what we learned in the pandemic that we really needed to be able to do large scale uh, data collection um, of, uh, in qualitative studies very rapidly. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> and that digital capabilities now allowed us to do that much better than in the past. So uh, this team had indeed, through the pandemic, been doing lots of these studies, had built up a very large network for doing it. And in their proposal, they're really aiming to build on what they've already done. Um, 
in a very collaborative way with a diversity of stakeholders. Next slide, please. And with their global network uh, um, that is, is very much embedded in applied uh, research and using qualitative methods to rapidly improve healthcare worldwide. Next slide, please. Okay, now I didn't want to put you off by showing you how high the, the, the bar is, uh, because actually, if you look at the figures, the people that actually managed to put in a proposal to better methods, better research, a qualitative proposal, have got a reasonable chance. And the thing is, uh, because you can apply at any time, you can take as long as you like and need to collaboratively create a really good team, your networks, your ideas, your initial evidence base, all of that you need. Um, and actually, if you put in a proposal, the reviewers and the panel as well really want to see this kind of uh, work uh, uh, undertaken. And the comments you get back, although they may be painful at the time, um, as Alicia was describing you know that the feedback is usually very helpful in terms of helping you improve your proposal either the proposal itself or the way you've communicated it and often leads to success on resubmission so um you know although bart simpson um, told us that trying is the first step towards failure actually in grant proposals failing is the first step towards success Fun getting funding is a long process and hopefully this will inspire you to take the first step Thanks very much. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lucy, for that really clear overview of the uh, the scheme, the process, um, the uh, the criteria um, for uh, threshold for funding for the scheme. Um, you've clearly laid out uh, very detailed criteria, and that gives us a real flavour for what the panel's looking for and how we can start to think about the work that we need to do to submit a high quality application to the scheme. Uh, and I think your message about um, talk to people, build a team, um, start talking is a very, very um, good advice to give to people on the call because we had, what was it, over 50% of people said they got an idea for all kind of methods-based research when we did the poll. So there's clearly a lot of interest there. And so hopefully all of those people um, have really got a sense for what this scheme can offer. Um, go and have a look at the example, go and have a look at the, uh, the website and see what examples are there in terms of qualitative methods research. So thank you for a really great overview of the scheme to um, Lucy and both to Rosalind. So um, that comes to the end of our short talks and it's great that we've still got half an hour um, to do questions and answers. Um, we've covered a huge amount of ground in today's webinar, both giving you examples of funding streams to, uh, to apply to in terms of applied qualitative research and also to the uh, BMBR scheme in terms of methodology research. Um, so if I can ask the panel members to um, put their cameras um, on so we can see everybody. That's great, thank you. And um, we've got a team working behind the scenes, Rebecca and Olga, who have been monitoring the chat um, and have been looking at collecting uh, questions or comments that are about similar themes. Um, so we can hear from uh, Rebecca and Olga um, about uh, some questions and answers and I'll, I'll facilitate the chat and I'll bring in different panel members um, as we go through, if that's okay. So um, over to uh, Rebecca first, please, if we've got um, a question or comment um, or a cluster of comments or questions from the chat. Thank okay. you. Hi, hi Claire. Uh, we've had lots of questions. So I think we're gonna be just taking them from um, their kind of how many votes they've had. So our top voted question at the moment, and I think this is probably for anyone on the panel. Do you have any examples of qualitative research that's been funded beyond qualitative interviews? So for example, arts-based or creative qualitative methods. And is this something that's also considered by the NIHR? Great, thank you. Um, so I'll, I'll go to Marion. I think I noticed quite a lot on, on Marion's slides, and um, particularly in relation to the social care funding stream. And then, so Marion and then Elaine in the first instance, please. 
Um, so that was actually what I was going to say. I, I, there have been funded within the social care stream. Uh, I'm afraid I don't have titles at the tip of my fingers, but we've definitely um, had some arts-based uh, projects funded. Um, Elaine, I think, was going to come in. Thank you, Elaine. Yeah, so I don't know whether you had noticed, but we recently ran a program development grant call that was specifically encouraging applications from partnerships between community groups and researchers. Um, and they were reviewed in a completely different way. It was led by our patient contributors on the panel and the, the applications were reviewed mainly by the patient that by the public contributors. And we had lots of really, really interesting qualitative studies in that arts, linked to arts, but also linked to, you know, developing menus for people and some really, really, really different stuff. So I don't think those, we're just sort of going through the contracting phase. So once those projects have been, have completed the contracting phase, you'll be able to see what they are. But we, the other thing about that was we got lots and lots of applications that weren't from the usual suspects. And I noticed there was a question saying that the NIHR feels like a closed shop and that I understand that completely. But I think if you just, just sort of try and scratch below the surface, there are these opportunities for, for applications from people that haven't been successful. And I certainly didn't recognize hardly any of the names on, and we funded um, 16 projects in that round. So it was a lot of projects we funded. So keep looking and keep scratching below the surface. Mm. Fantastic, thank you. Look forward to seeing those uh, examples of projects that were funded through that scheme. Um, Olga? Thank you, Claire. We had quite a few comments from qualitative researchers saying that qualitative research is still being seen as filling the gaps and being kind of a top up uh, type of research on top of the quantitative research to, to help with quantitative research. Is it still the case or are we moving from that, that situation? Thank you. I think, well, I can go again back to, to Marion and to Elaine and, and either to Gareth, who've all shown actually examples of where qualitative research is being funded uh, as, as standalone in of its own right. Um, and it particularly links to, I think, the notion that we had uh, when we did our launch uh, event last year about just really emphasising the value of qualitative research in terms of improving healthcare, improving the health of people and so if we can get better at showcasing that value then uh you know that that helps to um overcome maybe some of the perceptions that it is only just the you know just an add-on or a bit of a, 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 a maybe a lesser part of the problem but i'll i'll just go over to uh, uh maybe elaine um first again please yeah i mean i guess that's that's what i was trying to highlight that that is the perception and it's up to you to change it actually you know if we don't get applications then we can't fund them there was also a comment saying why why have we why have developing and testing complex interventions fallen out of favor and i just want to bust that myth as well it hasn't at all it's just that i don't think that's all that we should be funding but i think alicia is going to come in thank you Alicia? Uh, yes, I think that um, each of the funding streams are quite different on this front. So if you look at health services, uh, health and social care uh, delivery research, I'm on that panel and I would say uh, sometimes I think where's the quantitative research, you know, as a mixed methods researcher. So there's a lot of qualitative research goes there. Sometimes it's fully qualitative studies. Sometimes there's just a tiny bit of quantitative research. Um, so um, it, it does depend on the stream. I think it's also getting so much better than it was. And that our panels are have qualitative researchers on them who make a stand for things. I take Elaine's point that sometimes it's, oh, that's not quite the kind of qualitative research I do. Um, and there can be a, a little bit of um, overcritical stance on, on, on that front. But I think it's improving. And I totally agree with Elaine. Just keep knocking at the door because I think it's just it's it's open and it'll open further. 
Fantastic. Thank you for that advice. Uh, Marion? So I guess I was going to come in and say exactly that, that, you know, it's and not all. Um, many, many, uh, almost half of the of the um, applications we consider in RFPB are for feasibility studies. And absolutely, the, the panel recognises that you, you're not going to be able to uh, fully uh, tease out the feasibility issues without that qualitative element. Uh, and all of our panels are multidisciplinary. And so we, we clearly recognize that, that, that it's definitely and not all. Um, and I guess the other thing I wanted to say is that actually the panels are trying to fund research. Um, so if it's a good research question, the panel will actually work as hard as they possibly can to, to ensure that it gets funded by, by giving you feedback and just asking you to, to tweak things. Thank you. Um, yeah, that's certainly the experience that I've had on, on, on the Programme Grants Committee, working in, in some of the lane sort of panels. That's, it is a very positive approach and uh, the scheme really does want to fund good quality research. Um, so thank you for, for reminding us about that. And, and also, I think, go on to, you can go on to the portfolios so at HS and DR portfolio. Um, you know, all the projects that are funded there, go and have a look around the NIHR websites and have a look at the examples of projects um, that have, uh, are funded there for qualitative research I think you'll probably find that, that that's going to be really useful okay uh, I can't see any more hands up from the panel so um, we can move on to the next question or comment please uh, Rebecca hi yes so another popular um, question was to ask if the panel could tell us how what they see as rigorous methodology in qualitative research okay Thank you. That's an excellent question. Um, I'll start with Lucy, if I if I may. Uh, yeah, I think really the same criteria that you will see throughout the qualitative literature, and and of course there's been a lot of discussion over this uh, 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 over the years, and lots of guides to what is uh, rigorous qualitative research. So. Um, yeah, I did. I did hear something about reproducibility earlier, um, and and I, I don't think necessarily that would be uh, a, a requirement at all. Um, it's it's the usual things to do with, uh, you know, the depth, the trustworthiness, the transparency, um, you know. And these days, I think as well, of course, uh, the whole issue of co-production and um, end user involvement, which is a really important and uh, current issue at how that relates to qualitative research, because of course it's not the same thing, but it's highly relevant. And you might have noticed that in the Best Methods, Better Research proposals uh, this year that were funded, uh, two of them were very much about how one engages with users. So um, yeah, I, I think, you know, the, the discourse that you see within the quality of literature already gives you a good guide to uh, what people on the panels will, will see as rigorous. Thank you, Lucy. Um, I'm just wondering, is there anything else, Alicia, you'd like to, um, to come in uh, on this issue? Yeah, yes, so I totally agree with Lucy. Um, I, I would put something else at the first stage. You can't make any judgments about what Lucy said until people have described what they're going to do. So it's that transparency aspect of things and getting that detail in there. And too often you see, um, you know, a, a paragraph about methods where the same thing is being said in every sentence, or you have a number of paragraphs spread across the application and they're saying just the same Thing, which is a vague statement about what's going to be done, put into the panel's mind what you're going to do and how you're going to do it. I think people have already said this earlier on, but I, it's a really, really important thing because we can't make judgments about the rigour of what you're proposing uh, un until we know what, what you're actually going to do. Thank you. Um... I'll just check to see if any of the other panel members have got hands up. No, okay, uh, thank you. Uh, can we move on to the next question, Olga, please? Thank you. Thank you, Claire. So there was a question about who actually is a methodologist and a qualitative methodologist in particular. Is it a researcher or is it something else? 
Yeah, thank you. That's a really excellent question. So I think in the in the NIHR incubator, we, you know, we we define we think about methodologists, people who who develop and apply procedures. Um, they apply procedures, tools, um, techniques for gathering, analysing, uh, interpreting data across uh, you know health, and social um, care um, context. So. Um, that's kind of a very broad definition. Um, somebody that might um, uh, apply good, rigorous methods, as we've just been discussing, um, or um, develops innovations in, in methodology, so in techniques of, of data collection analysis uh, or knowledge mobilization, whatever. So I guess there are two aspects to how you might define yourself as a, as a methodologist. Um, I'll go to um, panel members. Yes, Alicia. I'm glad that question was asked, and that, that was a great answer, Claire. And, and I, I'm glad the question was asked because I think it is, um, a, it's not an odd label, but it, it, it's, a, it's a bit of a challenging one because I don't think of myself as a methodologist unless I am developing methodology. I think of myself as a mixed methods researcher. Sometimes people call me a qualitative researcher. I often think of myself as a social scientist because I am bringing social science methods to um, to health and social care research. Um, and I have come across problems with the use of the term methodologist in my own organization, where some people apply it to people who are developing methodology and other people apply that label to people who are applying it, their, their methodological expertise um uh just using the methods in, in in a study and so it can cause some confusion so great that you've cleared cleared that up claire thank you um anybody else would like to comment uh, is a perspective so maybe from elaine you've got the new um focus within the program grants to where people can uh, focus on methodological questions and so is there anything else to add in terms of the way that the programmes grants would, um, what would they consider as a methodologist? I've never even thought about that as a problem, <laughs> to be honest. But clearly it is. We all like we all like labels. But um, I, I mean, it's the type. I, I mean, I guess when I'm thinking about the sorts of things we might fund <clears throat> in the programme development grants, they're they're. It's the project, I guess, rather than the person doing it. That's uh, that's the important, the important thing. Um, so yeah, I've nothing, I've nothing further to add other than to, other than to uh, share your pain if you want to label. <laughs> Thank you, um, Rebecca. Oh, Marion. Sorry, Marion's got a hand up. No, I was just going to come in and say. So for for the methodologist call. Um, when we were looking at the imbalance between people who were lead uh, researchers and people who were co-applicants, we based it solely on what people were self-report, self-identifying as their professional background. Uh, when it comes to specifying the call, we'll be coming to you in the methodology incubator to, uh, to, to help us define it properly in a way that everybody will understand. Oh, that's fantastic. To hear yet thank you okay um rebecca um yeah so I, i'm just kind of squishing the next two top questions together because i think they're asking a similar thing so do the panel think that qualitative research is still viewed as the glue that sticks the quantitative research together i.e the bit that comes before and after and maybe in the middle um, or is there an appetite for and a sort of appreciation for standalone applied qualitative research? Yeah, I think we, we probably covered that a little bit um, already uh, in terms of the examples that we've been given and the panel members um, have, uh, I think, given us a sentiment that, that the schemes are open to um, to fund standalone qualitative research, and if the question is is right and can lead to, to patient benefit, um, is there anything anybody wants to just pick up on that, or do we feel that's been answered previously? I've scrolled across the panelists. Yep. Okay. Nothing else to add to that. Uh, thank you. 
Is there anything else, Rebecca, that is is um, missing from the previous, as you think? Um, I'm not sure. I mean, um, if you feel you've answered it, then then I think we'll move on. Okay. Oh, Elaine's got a hand up. Thank you, Elaine. Yeah, it was about it was about something different actually. So um, I'll, I'll maybe not say anything at this stage, Claire. We'll see see if the question comes up. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, Olga, um, is the next comment or question, please? Thank you, thank you Claire. It's a request for advice, really, and I think that many of our audience can identify with it. So someone said, I'm based at a small university that doesn't have senior researchers, professors with experience of NIHR funding. So how might I be able to seek a mentor from elsewhere to help me to apply for funding for qualitative research? And so far, the person's experience with NIHR was that it was rather a closed shop, unfortunately. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I think. Um, yeah. I think we've we've heard from um, the panel members today that uh, hopefully we're trying to myth bust that that sentiment that NIHR is is a closed shop. Um, there will be opportunities for mentorship, I guess, in uh, in your your own professional networks and the uh, the kind of groups or schemes that, that you're involved with. So do have a look around for opportunities for getting mentored by somebody that might have those experiences um, in your professional groups and your, your disciplinary groups. There are probably opportunities uh, around. I know the NIHR has a mentor scheme, but I think you have to be a member of the academy to be able to access that. And maybe Gareth can, can, can confirm that. So I can see lots of hands up. So I'll just go to um, firstly to Rosalind. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, I think we can often suffer from a similar perception at MRC, and it does, as I think someone alluded to earlier, it kind of becomes a chicken and an egg problem where those applications aren't coming in, so they don't get funded because there is this perception that they won't get funded. Um, and I think it can be daunting to put in an application when you don't have someone to mentor you through it. But I would say, from my perspective, and I presume it's very similar at NIHR, make use of, of the program managers. So people in my position, we're really happy to talk to you. We have lots of resources that we can help you with. Um, and particularly if you're at a very early stage of your career, we kind of tend to devote more time to helping helping um, applicants who are at an earlier career stage. So don't be shy to get in touch with us um, if you want to ask questions or, you know, just have a chat. Oh, if you do do that, I would say from, from my perspective, it's always great if you come in with a two pager with a kind of outline of your proposal, that always helps a lot. Great, thank you for offering uh, to give that feedback. Um, Marianne? Uh, so I presume I'm going to say what many other people are going to say that the RDS, so so the the research design service or what will become the research support service, are absolutely fantastic for people who who are in this position. Will be able to give you the methodological support, signpost you to uh, others who may be able to provide that support. Um, and just to um, just to reiterate, for me, one of the nicest things about uh, RFSC in particular is that many if not most of our successful applicants are from uh, less research intensive universities that don't have uh, big established groups so so um, pl please please persist who, whoever is asking that question because if you don't try you won't get um, so um, yeah that's great, thank you. Um, I'll go to Gareth and then Elaine, please. Thanks, Claire. Uh, just just to confirm that, yeah, the mentoring scheme at the minute is only open to to academy members, so that's probably not an option for this person in particular. I think just to to maybe take an opportunity to try and flip the narrative on its head a little bit, because like I think this person that's asking this question is exactly the sort of person that we want to be applying for funding and the exact sort of person that we want to be giving funding to. And I know it seems daunting and potentially. This next sentence might sound even a little flippant, but actually just submitting an application 
for example, for an advanced fellowship, you'd get, even in even if you were unsuccessful, you'd get such amazing feedback from our committee on who you could potentially collaborate, which supervisors would be appropriate, what training you could put into your application to take it to that next level. So I think if you can overcome the idea of it being a closed shop and to submit that application, I think you'd get really good feedback from, from our committee in the first instance. I'd echo Marion's suggestion around the RDS, and I'd also echo Rosalind's suggestion around contacting us as, as programme managers, because as gatekeepers to the scheme, we can point you in the direction of people who are interested in the same area as you, give you general advice and do a bit of signposting as well. So just encouragement, really. Please keep trying. Please do what you want to do. Thank you, Gareth. Um, Elaine, I'll come to you and then Alicia, please. Mm. Yes, it sort of links to a point I was going to to respond to, which was about the eligibility criteria for the various schemes, and it is really confusing. And some of the schemes are open to um, people from England, Scotland, Wales, and Ireland. And some of the schemes are only open to people from from England, and that is a problem at the moment. But the good news is this is something that the NIHR is addressing. So hopefully looking forward, there will be more consistency around the eligibility for the, for the various schemes and more schemes will be opened uh, to the devolved administration. So watch this space. Mm. Oh, that's great to hear, thank you. Alicia? So the point I want to make relates to the, the previous question that we decided we'd answered, which is about um, the, the value that is placed on qualitative research. Because I, th I think that um, 20 years ago, I interviewed mixed methods researchers about how to maximize the benefit of doing mixed methods research. And um, they talked about the way structural issues affected what they did. And one of those structural issues was funding panels. And so it's fantastic. You know, this event today, all that's been said sort of shows how things have changed in the past 20 years and will change over the next 20 years. But I think that there is another structural issue that affects the value of qualitative research in our field. Um, and that is, um, REF, the Research Excellence Framework, that if you can't get a four-star publication doing qualitative research, your only value to your organisation is if you can help somebody else bring in money, you know, research income. You know, if you, if you bring it down to really sort of harsh look at um, university um, research. So I think as well as doing the great work that all the panels are doing today, reflecting on practice and changing practice, I think it's brilliant. I think we also need to look at how REF is valuing qualitative research. And I think if that was unlocked, we'd see a lot of qualitative researchers feeling more valued and feeling like they could take more risks in terms of putting in funding themselves. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Alicia. That's a point really well made. And I'm, I'm pleased to say that in the incubator, we're, we're trying to do some work or we have plans to do some work around um, looking at the REF impact case studies, identifying which ones have got qualitative methods, qualitative research in them. So there's the two aspects, the qualitative research and the value of that and the impact of that, and also methodology research, so the research on research methods, how, how is that being captured in REF impact statements? So that work is, is, uh, is, is just starting within the methodology incubator. And um, we've got a year to go in the current incubator. We've tendered for an extension during the last call. So if we're successful, we're going to do a lot more work around, around impact and qualitative research and perspectives on impact will be fully part of that. So please do look out for that space and thank you for setting us up uh, to, to kind of work on that more. Um, just picking, I know we've got just two minutes left. So just going back to the point made about how do I find somebody to work with? Um, yep. Yeah, go and have a look at our new networking map on the methodology incubator website that was part of the reason why we were wanting to do some work to help people make connections to find people in their areas of expertise as, as researchers either as methodologists or applied health qualitative researchers so do go onto the map start populating it and then people can hopefully find like-minded colleagues or colleagues to, to approach and start talking to about their ideas and about their research and 
and I think as the panel have, have, have uh, already mentioned, don't be afraid to talk about you know your ideas because articulating them is really important in kind of formulating the rationale, getting clear in your own mind about the story that you want to put into the application. It's always value in talking to other people about, about the research ideas. So do go on and, and use the networking map as well. Okay, I can see that it's 12.29, uh, we're coming to the end of our time. Um, I would really like to thank everybody, the panel, uh, all the speakers today for contributing to such a really uh, broad, wide ranging and inspiring session around funding for qualitative uh, research and methodology research. Um, we've covered such a lot of ground. Hopefully everybody um, has found something useful today. Please do go and follow the link to fill in the evaluation survey after the webinar. You'll be able to put your email address in there, and if you do that, we can send you the slides. Um, otherwise, we haven't got your contact details to send you the slides. So please do tell us how useful this session has been so that we can plan future events for qualitative researchers. Thank you again to all our panel, and thank you to the NIHR Academy colleagues for helping us to put on this event today. And on that note, I'll draw the webinar to a close. Thank you very much, everybody, for your time. Bye-bye. <laughs>